Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have poured upon each and every one of us. You have granted us, Father, so much, so much in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding because you love us, but you love all your children. But it really comes down to each individual child of, of how sincerely they want to love you and worship you. All say that they do. I shouldn't say all, but many say that they do. But many fall, fall sh uh, well short of what they should be doing and thinking and acting upon. So we do thank you, Father, for helping, leading us, guiding us, and directing us along the way to receive the information that we need to be successful in life. And that success is to have thy knowledge and have you as our Father and, and know where we are ultimately going to be for eternity. And we thank you for each and every every tidbit of information and knowledge. We also have these unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them always in perfect season. Also, Father, we, we come before you, we, we pray, dear Lord, for our new president, our vice president, and their cabinet, and all the appointed and elected officials. Father, we, we pray that they will earnestly seek out thy face and follow thy ways, knowing we know what is coming and, and what's going to happen. But, Father, to follow a leader or a, a ruler uh, is important if they're following your ways. But we know, Father, you are our leader and our ruler. And if those other members that are appointed will follow you, we know it will go a lot easier in this nation. And we pray for each and every one that they will. We also have these prayers before you at this time, Father. We pray for the Justice family. McDowell and wife, Heather, Caleb, Isaiah, KC, for June's family members to look to you for guidance. On all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal in Yahshua's precious holy name. We pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel that you watch over them, lead them, guide them, and direct them. We pray, dear Lord, that they have not forsaken thy word. And if they have, Father, they will repent and get back on that narrow path of truth. We also pray, dear Lord, for Israel and for our nation, for thy kingdom to come, knowing that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, Come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day they're on the front lines helping your children. And we pray, dear Lord, for our military who are in arm's way or who are about to go into arm's way for their safety and speed return. And we pray, dear Lord, for all those that are lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> okay, we're getting back in our Father's Word in the book of Revelation with chapter 3, verse 13. A lot of things are happening very rapidly in this generation of the fig tree. And really, we can ask one or two questions. Is a person... Is a person a milk Christian, or are they a meat Christian? And and when I say that, what 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 am I really asking? When you ask a person, are you a milk Christian or a meat Christian? They may not understand what you're asking them. So what what do we mean by that? A milk Christian versus a meat Christian? Can anybody answer that question? <coughs> Well, a milk Christian, basically, is a Christian who has come to the Lord Jesus Christ, knows the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior, believes that he died and resurrected for our sins, 
and that's about it. They, they don't really uh, know much more than that. And they feel to some degree and are taught to some degree that's all they need to know. Where a meat Christian is one that uh, will receive the fullness of the entire Word of God, both Old and New Testament. They believe just like the milk Christian about the Lord Jesus Christ, but there's, they know that there's a whole lot more to the story than just death and resurrection. That they, they learn like the parable of the fig tree, they learn who the Kenites are, they learn uh, uh, many things that are, well basically everything that our Lord has taught in his word. That doesn't necessarily mean they remember everything, but they learn it. They study the word of God instead of just read it, reading over it. A good example of a, a milk Christian would be, well, they say, well, I read the entire Word of God in a year. Or I read the entire book of Revelation in three days. Well, okay, you, you can do that very easily, but you can't study it in depth in that amount of time. That's why it takes us, uh, I guess, over a year to study the entire book of Revelation chapter by chapter, verse by verse, precept by precept, line by line, to where we can take what we're studying and then teach it to somebody else. That's a meat Christian. And um, today in Revelation chapter 3, verse 13, we, we, last week we left off with verse 12 telling, telling us, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, a milk Christian can't grasp the understanding of that. But a meat Christian can understand what that means. Why? Because they've studied the entire Word of God and they realize that a pillar is something that holds up the building. Well, who's the building? We are. The temple of God temple of God and that pillar our father says that his election his children that that overcome the things of this world will be used as a pillar in the temple of God meaning that they're holding up the building the fact that God can use you to hold up the very temple in the millennium now think about that what a blessing that's why we're tested now to show us what we're lacking or what we've overcome. So, are you staying and, and learning God's Word or are you basically biblically illiterate and want to stay that way? Some people do. You know, just like what we were talking about the uh, immigration thing. Some people want to remain a certain way and some people don't. Well, it's the same in Christianity. Some people want to remain ignorant. You say, well, that's crazy. I'm taught when I say ignorant, I mean biblically illiterate. Where they don't have the fullness of the understanding of our Father's Word. They don't want more than that. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. Well, sometimes God himself has placed blinders over a person. Yes, but you've got to understand, our Father doesn't prematurely put blinders on people. He places blinders on people because he doesn't want to see them basically blotted out from existence. In other words, they're heading down a path that if they continue and refuse God, they're going to be blotted out from existence. So in the meantime, he'll place blinders over them where they can't go any farther until the millennial period. See, we've studied and we understand that during the millennial period, nobody has blinders on. Nobody. Everything's lifted. So all they can see. On that note about blinders, I, I wish I'd written down the verse. But I read yesterday, I think it was Second Corinthians maybe. I'll have to look it up. But it also said that God of this world puts blinders on people. That's what I'm Small talking about. G. Oh, Satan. Small oh, G. yeah, Satan does as well. Mm -hmm. Satan does as well, but... Our Father Himself will also place blinders on His children if they're heading down a road of destruction and there's no way out. 
So he'll just kind of pull the reins back and say, all right, you're not going any farther until the millennial period. I never really thought about that. So I mean, I, I know about Satan's influence and stuff, but I never really thought about the aspect that he perfect, could put perfect example. blinders on someone. Let's say so you they got a, understand. Let's, perfect example where our father would place a blinder on someone. Let's say you got a church that a person was born and raised in, you know, because mm -hmm. their parents were there. And they're following the flyaway doctrine all their life. That's all they've been taught. Christ's resurrection and then flyaway doctrine. Well, we know flyaway doctrine is against, God's against it. We study that in Ezekiel 13, 20 very clearly. And um, also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But God still loves that individual. I mean, they might be doing a lot of good works, helping people and honest and trustworthy. And so, but they're being taught that any moment that Jesus Christ can come and remove them. So basically what they're really being taught that at any moment the first entity who appears can fly them away. Well, we know by our study the first entity to appear is not Jesus Christ, but Antichrist. So, <clears throat> Father is going to block them out from existence because that's all they know? I mean, that's what they've been taught. They don't know any different. And they really believe. They have, in, in their own eyes, in their own heart, they have faith, unshakable faith that this is going to happen. So our Father's going to come along and say, uh-uh, you're blotted out from existence. Say, See, that's where he places what's called the blinders over them, where they've learned so much at that point, but they're not going to learn anymore. So he places blinders of understanding where they're not willing to let go and let God at that point. They're following traditions of men. So he's going to wait until the millennial period when all the covering is going to be lifted off. There's not going to be no preacher over here, no reverend over here, no denomination over here, no denomination over there. There's only going to be one God, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father of all. And the truth, only the truth will be taught. And that's when all the blinders will be lifted off. Now it's up to them at that point to make their own decision. Because they're no longer following their good old reverend, their good old preacher. Mm -hmm. They're following God and God alone. Or not following. That's up to them at that point. So, so that's where the blinders can come in. Now the blinders you're talking about is the blinders that Satan brings forth. Those fiery darts and people just believe anything. All kinds of different things, which we're going to get into in just a moment. So with that being said, let's get, get into it. Revelation chapter 3, pick up where we left off in verse 13. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now the question is, do you? Do you hear? Do you understand what our Lord has been teaching us about all these churches? Because the next verse, we're getting ready to go into the last church. Now we've covered all kinds of different concepts of these different churches. Of what they, what, what they did right what they did wrong and we know we found only two churches and there are only two church types that Christ will find no fault with when he gets here which tells us something very important we need to know and understand what they taught because if we don't then we're liable to fall into a church that <coughs> is doing something wrong we you say well you're trying to be perfect I'm trying to yes if you want to use the word perfect, you can use the word perfect because the word perfect means mature. Mature in the word of God where we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt what we know, why we know it, and, and what the outcome is going to be. In other words, we know what tomorrow is going to bring us. We know what's going to happen to this world. We know how it's going to happen. Can you imagine to have that knowledge? Well. Some people do have that knowledge right now. And you do if you follow our Father's word as it is written and believe what our Father tells us about what's coming. So, that being said, we're getting into the church of Laodicea. 
Now, one thing about Laodicea I want to bring out very quickly. Um, it's very interesting when you when you when you're doing a study on the Church of Laodicea. There's a lot of different comments and commentaries and thoughts about the Church of Laodicea. Now, it is true that Laodicea was a main trade route. So coming out the gate, we know there's all kinds of different theologies coming into this place. But also, it's a pretty well-known uh, commentary that um, Paul never went to Laodicea. That um, none of the apostles ever went to Laodicea to start the church. That when Paul was in prison, he wrote to Colossae, which is right next to Laodicea, or pretty close to it as far as regions go. And during his uh, letter to Colossae, he asked them if they would also read that epistle to the Laodiceans. So the Laodicea is a city? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, it's a city. Um, <clears throat> so, how it started really for our understanding today really isn't important. We do know factually that the Laodiceans, at this particular point, were having church in a house in Laodicea. And they had become, there were Jews in Laodicea, and those Jews became what we call today Messianic. In other words, Jews that follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that being said, verse 14 reads, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. What does Amen mean, you remember? That's that. That's that. The faithful and true witness telling us, you don't need any more than what's right here. It's just like a church today. Any church. Well, let, let's, instead of using church, let's say individual. When you study the Word of God, the Word itself tells us, when you have two or three gathered in my name, I am with thee. Right? Which means the Lord is with you. Can you have two or three gathered without anybody else being in the room? Sure. How? Because you've got yourself, you've got the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and, well, and Jesus. That's right. So you've got three right So you've got three right there. So, see, a lot of people think, well, <coughs> I have to have a church, a, a building. You don't have to have a church building. What you have to have is faith. Now some people say, well, I need a pastor. I need someone to, to guide me in the understanding of the Word. Some people do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if a person truly wants to understand everything that our Father has given them in His Word, yes, it takes a lot longer, but they can do a self study and research and, and prayer and, oh, of course prayer, prayer. <laughs> yeah. that's why we always start with prayer yeah. because without prayer we cannot have that that avenue opened up for us because we always pray for the Lord to lead God and direct us that it is Christ teaching not Ron teaching it's Christ teaching you know but we can do this on an individual basis but it says the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. Um, that makes it complete within itself. I mean, we have been given from the very beginning the Word. You say, whoa, whoa, no, no, they didn't even know how to read and write. No, it was verbally given. Our Father even gave the Word to Adam. Remember, what was the seventh son of Adam? The seventh son of Adam was Enoch. Enoch taught the word. How do we know that? Because he was found without fault. As a matter of fact, 
he was taken to the kingdom without ever seeing death. Without ever ever having his flesh body go through that process. So, and also what he taught was the key of, not the key of David, but the, um, the who the Kenites were. You know, and what they did from the garden. So, our Father's Word has been around for a long, long time, ever since, even from the beginning. Verse 15. Now, he's talking about the Laodiceans. Now, this is interesting about this church. I know thy works. Now, that doesn't, just because you hear works, that doesn't mean good works. Listen. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. In other words, this is to say, I would like you to be one or the other. I mean, you say, well, why would our Father want them to be cold? He wants them to do something, to make a stand, whether it's right or wrong at this point. See, this church at this point isn't doing anything. You say, well, how could there be a church then? Well, again, probably they are a milk Christian church. They accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're not accepting anything else. They're not helping anybody else. They're doing all kinds of different things. Remember, they're on a trade route, so they're probably being blown around by every kind of new thing that comes along. They're, they're, they're like the, the parable of the salt that's lost its seasoning. Remember that parable? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You know what this <clears throat> excuse me, makes me think of? What? Is the churches where the people go and they just go every Sunday or every Wednesday. And, you know, that, that's their, they think that's their part to do. And they don't do anything else. Right. In other words, they walk outside the, the church doors and act just like a heathen before they came in. I mean, how many people have we seen like this where, you know, they go, you're a Christian? You know, because of how they act and behave towards one another. You know, they don't make a stand for anything. And, and, and another thing, they, they get lazy. This, this church gets lazy where it's almost like they don't want to upset anybody. You know. Oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some say, well, it might drive people away if we teach the truth. If we get, if we talk about flyaway doctrine and that is wrong. Well, then let the suckers go. You know, I tell you right now, I'd rather have five people in the house of God that want to study the Word of God as it is written than a thousand playing church. Oh, a thousand people bring in all kinds of funds. Do all kinds of things. But at what cost? The cost basically of your very soul. And you got a lot of, you know, I, I'm not judging churches. They're, they're, God's judging them. You can see for yourself what they're doing or not doing. And some of them, oh my goodness, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I had the privilege of going to some of these cathedrals in Germany. I mean, lined in gold. I was just absolutely astounded, gorgeous, beautiful, you know. But the stuff that was coming out of them, you know. And they, they, they see the bottom line is if you're not if you're not offending Satan, you're on the wrong path. You know, because this world as the word says, will be whoring after Satan when he gets here. Why? Because they think he's Jesus Christ. So if you're not offending Satan now, you're on, you're on the wrong road. You're on the wrong path. You're not working. You're not making a stand for something. And that's what this church was not doing. They weren't making a stand. Verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, that means barely warm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee. That means I will vomit thee out of my mouth. God doesn't like them. They're mamby-pamby Christians. Oh, don't, don't, don't teach that. You might offend somebody. 
Father gets a bad taste in his mouth about people like that, and he gets rid of it. What does he do? Well, he removes that candlestick. They no longer have understanding. They no longer have understanding. They're just just like what you were talking about. They just show up. Um, the last big church that we went to, hundreds of people showed up. Hundreds. And they were having two and three services that day. And they were filled to the brim. I'm, I'm literally hundreds of people. But all they did was play music. I think they I think they spoke three verses. But the rest of the time they were playing music and putting on a play. Different plays. In other words, people were showing up to be entertained. And that's how they conducted it. You say, well, then how do they get such a big church? Because that's what people want. They want to be entertained. To me, the word itself is all the entertainment I need. Yes, do we sing hymns? Absolutely. But what is a hymn? A hymn is a song of prayer to my father. Yeah. I'm not here to try to entertain anybody. Even when I would get out the, uh, when when Shane and Don and I would play in the band and all, it wasn't to en entertain the people in the church. It was to give praises to the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, and and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong in having music and and even if little skits. I mean, they were really nice skits. But three words, three verses? How can a person grow in the Word of God in three verses? Enough to sustain them for a week until they get back again? Or maybe three, four days until the, the middle of the week? That's not going to sustain them. Wouldn't me. You know. But that's what people want today. You know. Or they, they have what they call motivational speakers. You know. Sounds real good. You know, they, they motivate. They get people excited. But the thing is, they're not getting them excited in the verses themselves. Because to me, the verses themselves, if you read them and stick with the subject and the object and the article, you can have the knowledge to overcome every obstacle in this world. Every single obstacle. Like I was talking about um, prayerfully praying about employment. That there's no, yeah, I might be losing sleep in a couple of days, or the last couple of days, but that doesn't mean I faithfully don't understand that my father's in control and he'll take care of it. My weakness is the flesh. Whenever that flesh gets intervened in there, well, what about this? What about that? What about, well, it doesn't matter. Father is in control, and he'll take care of it. You know. But he wants me to be prayerfully guided and to follow what he gives me. And, most importantly, to wait on an answer. That's, I, isn't this where we all screw up? Mm -hmm. Where we wow. pray about something... And we don't wait for the answer. We just say, well, Lord, should I go this way or go that way? You don't hear anything, so you go that way. <laughs> well, guess what happens? It doesn't work, does yeah, it? No. You know. And then what do you say? We all say the same thing. I should have waited on an answer. But this is what the Lord says. Look, because you're, you're, you're lukewarm and you're not doing anything, I'm spewing you out of my mouth. 17, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods. Now, why would some of these people say, I am rich, and increased with goods if they're lukewarm? Because they think that their possessions is the blessings from God. See, a lot of people will go, like, we'll use, still use your example, Jim. A lot of people that he's talking about here, these particular individuals, that they'll go to church and 
they're lukewarm. They're not really doing anything. They're mamby pamby Christians. However, they're making a lot of money. They're living in nice homes. They're driving nice cars. In other words, they don't have want for anything. Now they believe that it's because they're going to church. And that they're praying whatever they're praying. But the thing is, if you're going to a place that God does not appoint as being a true church, how are they being successful? They're being successful because they've learned how to get things in the ways of the world. And they follow the ways of the world. And they become part of the ways of the world. That's why you have so many people going to churches and when they go outside the doors they act just like heathens before when they came in. Because <clears throat> they're not supposed to... See, when you become a true Christian, what do you become? It's called a new creation. You actually, you think differently, you talk differently, you act differently than the old person as it's, as it's written. It's written as the old man, but it's genderless. You, 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 you don't want to be that person anymore. Yes? You may not realize it, but other people see it. Some do. The only ones that actually truly see it are those that are truly following the ways of the Lord. But the people living in the world don't see it. They think you're, you're part of the buddy-buddy system. You're doing what they're doing. So, I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. And I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you why I say that. Because the fact of the matter is, when you reach a person like that and you basically tell them what they're doing, no, that's against our Father's word, no, what I'm saying is I don't necessarily agree with the statement that that only those that are true Christians see it because those that aren't see it. Mm-hmm. They do. I don't understand. You 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 uh, you turn to Christ and you become a Christian. Christian. You know. The spirit is the spirit. Mm -hmm. Discernment's discernment. Mm -hmm. So now you have that light in you that those that don't have the light can sense. What I'm talking about is the difference between a milk Christian and a meat Christian. Where a meat, that's what I brought out, what the difference is in the beginning. Because the meat Christian can read the same verse as a male Christian, but a meek Christian will get the third level of understanding to help them, guide them through any obstacle where a milk Christian always has to be guided. So when you have a, a milk Christian trying to, to stay in their position, in other words, never growing in the understanding, of our Father's Word, never wanting to get deeper understanding. And a meek Christian comes along and tries to build them up, and they refuse that. That is where they believe that what they have is enough. They don't need any more. That's what's happening here with these people. See, this is a Christian, let's not forget. The reason our fathers haven't uh, them, uh, brought them forward about the Laodiceans is because they are a Christian church. However, they think what they have is enough. They think they're rich. That's also rich in the Word. And they think that their increase of goods and stuff that they have is because of God. Now, it may have been... But our Father is saying, look, I'm going to spew you out if you don't change. If you don't, if you don't get off your high horse and start looking to me and following what I'm giving you, I'm going to remove that candlestick from you. I'm going to, I'm going to spew you out. You're not going to know, come here from Sikkim, as Murray puts it. Because it says, and have need of nothing. Now who do you know? 
that believes they have need of nothing. Well, a person who believes they have all that they need. You say, well, wait a minute now, isn't that a Christian? Because a Christian believes they don't need anything. Oh, no, a true Christian knows they need God. Period. Well, this is a, supposed to be a church They're of God. They're not saying that. They're saying, I am rich and I have need of nothing. Ah, so it's an individual uh, prosperity. <clears throat> no, I don't need, it's not saying they need God or that they're leaning on God. Well, they're not leaning on God because that's why I said what I said earlier is that they believe that what they have is enough and they don't need anybody or anything else. Well, that's what I was going to say because a lot of times you said that the, they look at what they have, their material wealth, as blessings from God. Well, material wealth can be blessings from God if you view that it came from God. And you use it accordingly. And you use it accordingly to God's how many people get received from the Lord, they believe that, but they don't do anything with it? They say, well, I can't, I don't have enough, you know. Well, that might be the position that they're in. They don't have enough to, to, to help other people. But the thing is, what are we physically talking about here? How can a church or church body or an individual, because this is what it comes down to, how can they help somebody else if they don't have enough money? By sharing the word with them. Sharing the word is the most important mm -hmm. thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Sh sharing truth, living the example. When they come at you and ba 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 and you just stand there and not necessarily take it, but it falls off you like water on a duck's back because mm -hmm. you know they're part of the world. They're part of the problem. And it's not your problem, it's their problem. But that's hard to do when it's happening to you. No, that's the big part of the world's problem right now. It's all me, me, me. What I did, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm the one that did it. You know, not giving God any credit whatsoever. And not going to Him for their direction. They're just blundering on, and if they attain things, you know, I attained it. But let's not forget, these are the people that are in the church, mm -hmm. this particular church. You see, you can see, a lot of people think that as long as they're going to church, they got it, they got mm -hmm. it made, they got it covered. Well, not if you're going to the wrong kind of church. I mean, that's what all all this has been about: what kind of church to be a, be a part of, and what church not to be a part of. And it says, "And knowest not that thou art wretched." and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Now some people say, well, well, wait a minute now. I thought, didn't we just read about one of the churches Christ found no fault with, that they were poor? It's a different kind of poor. Mm -hmm. There's monetarily poor, and then there's spiritually poor. They're deader than a hammer. You say, well, they're a church, yes. Some, some are rich in the ways of the world. Well, why are they naked? Because they have no righteous acts. That's why they're naked. I've mentioned this a time or two. And I tell you what, I want to go real quickly to Revelation chapter 19. Hold your place here. Go to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Just a couple verses. I've talked about this before. But it, it's the clothing. So you'll know what clothing it is that you wear in heaven. Chapter 19 in the book of Revelation is talking about the wife and the bride. They are a little bit different. Verse 7 gives you the wife and the bride gets ready. And the wife uh, was wed, actually, in the first earth age, if you want to get right down to it. But if you don't understand that, put it off on the shelf. So, uh, chapter 19, verse 7, and it reads, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's the Zadok, his set-aside ones, hath made herself ready. One more verse now, I'll expound. Eight, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed, or dressed, in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen 
is the righteousness of saints. In the Greek, it is the righteousness of saints. Now, in the righteous acts of the saints, every time you do a righteous act, it weaves a little bit more fine linen in your garment. Every time there's a righteous act done. And for you to wear in heaven. And that's this church type of Laodicea. It was going to be naked. Meaning what? They didn't have any righteous acts. They weren't doing... Well, what is a right... Going back to, to where we were in Revelation. What is a righteous act? What does righteous mean? To do what's right. According to our Father. That's the key. According to our Father. According to our Father. Not according to, to you. But ac not according to the, the church theology. But according to what our Father deems right. So, what is a righteous act? It's something that you act upon that your Father leads you to do. Whether it be help a person, whether it be help help a family member whether in other words you're doing a, a good will to someone else other than just self you're being selfless instead of selfish say well that's the thing we, we expounded on was the the doing for others was uh, where it's uh when you were naked you uh, when I was naked you clothed me when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was hungry, you gave me food. Well, a lot of people look at that as the material part mm -hmm. of the food, the drink, and the clothing. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the deeper level, it all is basically sharing the word with them. Sharing the truth with them. The truth, right. Because a lot of people will spew out words. Well, yes. But it's the, it's the truth of what the word means is what's most important. If you haven't learned anything about all these churches, the, the important thing to remember is that all these churches, except for this one, well, even this one, they were all churches, first of all. Mm -hmm. But they had good qualities and bad qualities. This particular church doesn't have any good qualities. They're right in the middle and they don't do nothing. Well, I can say they have a good quality because at least they <coughs> accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But that's as far as they go. You say, well, that's important. Of course it's important. But there's so much more to learn. I mean, it's like a person. I don't, I, I don't want this to sound bad. It's going to come out that way, but I, I can't help it. It's like a person that comes up to you and says, well, you know, one negative thing after another after another that's that they're going through i mean it's 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 like a bad country song i mean one it's just one bad thing after another after another and your comment is well i'll pray for you well prayer is very important yes but what about maybe helping them along the way maybe enlightening them at that moment of despair with an actual scripture verse that can really help them instead of just saying, I'll pray for you. Or opening up your cupboard if, they, if there's need of food. You say, well, I don't have very much. Well, they have nothing. You know. I mean, the, we need to take just a little bit more of a step to not be a lukewarm person. Because that's what it comes down to. We're talking about church, but we're talking about individual people. It's like what we learned last week. You know, there there can be some good people in the church, no matter what kind of church it is. So let's let's look at these churches as we're talking about churches. Let's look at this as an individual basis. We need to be able to be used of God in whatever He deems on us to do. Can we help the world? Absolutely not. We can't help everybody in the world. But we can help somebody somewhere with something. 
Yes, the most important is the word. But the thing is, if a person's hungry, if a person's dying of thirst, hearing the word is going to do what for them? They're hungry. They can't think clearly. They're dying of thirst. You say, well, you're going to extreme. Oh, yes, I am, but I want to get the point across. See, how do we know what a person really needs? We don't. That's the key. We don't know, but our Father does. So once we communicate with Him, He knows what's on that person's heart. <clears throat> he knows whether or not to tell us, don't listen to this person, they're just after a con. Or you can do something. Every day going to work, on this one particular getting off the interstate, there's always somebody there in the corner when I get off. It's not always the same person. But after being there a year now, it's always the same group of persons. One one of five different people that are always there. You know. And one guy <laughs> I'll bring this out very quickly. Um, I, I guess I scared him to death, but he always had this little sign saying, um, prayerfully in need okay well of course they're not supposed to walk up to the cars because the cars are always stopped you know at this red light coming off the interstate and this guy starts walking up right to my window nobody else and of course me I grab my <laughs> I grab my 9 millimeter and I had to sit in my lap because I didn't know what he's going to do and he saw that, and he took a step back. I wasn't pointing it at him, but I didn't know what he was, what he wanted. And what he said, he says, he says, I'm a Christian, but I don't know what that means. In other words, in the front of my license plate, in the front it says Ezekiel 13:20. So I told him what that meant. And he didn't didn't say anything else. But the reason I bring this out, I pass these people by every day, and I've yet to give ever, any money out whatsoever. Why? Number one, God doesn't send out beggars. Number two, I've given to people before, but it's when the Lord's led me to do it. I've actually searched out people to give money to. Well, we've done that, yeah, on the holidays and stuff. And when the happens. Lord leads me to do it. So, my point with all this is, how do we know who to help and who not to help? There's only one way to know. That's godly discernment. But you cannot have godly discernment if you're lukewarm. Why? Because you're not listening to God. How can you listen to God and be lukewarm? Not caring one way or the other. How can you? See, this was a church, but they didn't care. They just didn't care about people. They probably didn't even care about each individual in the church. You know. And, and the sad thing is, people don't even do that in their families. Sometimes, I mean, they go to they want to go out in the highways and byways and look for someone to help when right there in their own. Well, it's the same principle as that you got a church that will uh, uh, not help individuals in, in, in their community, but they'll send somebody to El Salvador. Yeah, mission trip. You know. Now, who am I to say that they shouldn't send anybody else? I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's just like the, the comment I remember this person, and I've said this before, who, um, who wrote um, uh, um, Mother Teresa years ago mm -hmm. and she had compassion she says mother Teresa I, I want to come to Calcutta and I, I want to help the dying and the, and the starving and the needy and the helpless and mother Teresa wrote her back she says well I appreciate your compassion but go find your own Calcutta see we can have a Calcutta on any street corner I mean we, we were before the camera came on we were talking about this nation and what it's becoming. Don't tell me there's no work to be done here. You know, 
You say, well, there's a lot of people that don't want it. Yes, but there's someone somewhere that does. That's why we're doing this on camera. Just reaching out to, to, to whomsoever will. Will it grow someday? That's between our Father and, and them. You know. But we actually have more that watch on this than we do show up here. But point being is that we've got to maintain that we're not a lukewarm church. That means a lukewarm individual. That we take what we learn and we do something with it. Some might ask now, well, when do I do this? You don't believe that the Lord doesn't lead us? We've all done some things for some people at some times. That just means to be available for him when he calls. Listen. 18, I counsel thee. In other words, Jesus Christ himself is going to counsel. The thing is, are you listening? To buy of me. To what? To buy of me. What? Gold tried in the fire. Does that mean our Lord's going to give you gold? No, that means refine. Now, deeper understanding with this is the truth with all the slag and junk melted up. You say, how in the truth can, can, can the truth have uh, 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 slag and junk? Because if it's thrown in with a bunch of uh, denominational theologies of men, different ideas of man, what man brings forth, Father is very simple in his teaching, if you allow him to teach you the simp simplicity of it, and not the traditions of men. That thou mayest be rich. That's how you get rich. That's how you get rich for eternity. This is the rich he's talking about, is to have that spiritual gold of truth. I mean, when you have the spiritual gold of truth, you have knowledge, you have wisdom, and you have understanding how to overcome, think about this, any obstacle that comes your way. No matter, no matter where you're sitting, no matter who you're listening to, no matter what you're seeing, no matter what actions happen around you, you'll have the truth within you. And you'll have, you'll have a big old red flag come up if you need to get out of town, if you need to get out of the scene, you know. Just like helping people, some, and helping not others, others. You know, you'll know when to act and when not to act. And white raiment, that's the, the wedding supper, that thou mayest be clothed. And white raiment, that uh, not running around naked in heaven. You know, this almost sounds to me, when we get to the kingdom... If we read this correctly, and if I'm understanding it correctly, we're going to know who did a lot and who did little by what they're wearing. Because if your linen is closed with righteous acts, you could have a long flowing robe, or as Murray says, a teeny weeny bikini. <laughs> You're in the kingdom, you have righteous acts, but very little. Some people say, well, that's, that's a classification. I guess it is. That doesn't mean we're judging anybody. No, it's, it's supposed to be used to judge ourselves. It is. Not anybody else. According to the companion, the word by, uh, it refers to it saying that the members of the church of this dispensation have nothing to buy and nothing to pay with. In other words, even though they have all the material riches because they're spiritually deader than a hammer, they have nothing that they can give God and nothing they can buy from Him. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that classification mm -hmm. because you, you don't buy anything from God. You give. Well, no. Well, it does make the distinction that our salvation is the free grace gift of God. Yeah. But he does say, buy of me. Yes. In the, in the verse. Buy of me. What you're buying is, is your time. 
You're you're giving your time. You're giving him your time. That's what I'm saying. Because they rely mostly on them or relying totally on themselves and their material possessions. They have nothing left. They're being selfish yes. instead of selfless. Yes. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This word eye salve is an interesting word in the Greek. It means poultice, which is spread on sores basically to draw out poison. Poultice out of it and place it on your eye, which is the mirror to your soul. So, this causes you to open your eyes, your spiritual eyes, so that you can see the truth. And get out of the middle of the road and start being a can-do type Christian. Now, the bottom line with all this, God does not like do-nothing Christians. If he, if he gives you the truth and understanding, he's not just giving it to you. He's giving it, he expects you to do something with it. You know, it, it's almost like, this might be hard for some of you to, to, to remember, maybe less for Rachel, but when you first came to Christ, you were excited. Remember being excited about the word and the, how you wanted to share it. I mean, how God just opened your heart and your mind and he, you had all this emotion and you, you were exuberant about it. But what happens along the way? Well, yeah, you share it. But guess what you hit? A stone wall with people. Mm -hmm. They're not excited like you are. No, I, I remember Becca. I wish she was here. But uh, I remember Becca saying how excited she was about certain aspects of learning, and that she she you know how Becca gets she would uh, sh and, and I remember uh, um, um, Janet doing the same thing. You know, I'm excited and share that with people, but sh they found out that the other people weren't that excited. They they weren't receiving the same message. And they became discouraged. And I think that's what happens to all of us. How many times have we talked mm -hmm. about sharing certain things? And especially as a teacher, you know, I, I, I get excited and I want to share. And, and some things are, to me, are profound. And sometimes I share that, but it just doesn't come across that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I get no feedback of excitement. And that used to upset me. But see, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to, to put it out there and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. That's between them and God. You know. And we all, I think, come to that uh, <clears throat> lack of enthusiasm by other people at times. And... Um, Christ is really counseling here. He's telling you to make a poultice from the Word of God. That means to absorb it in your mind. And it will draw out that poison of Satan's lies throughout time. Those, those, those uh, different theologies of man. In other words, you can be in a church, just like what I said earlier, a person can be in a church for years and years and years, grow up in a church, and be lied to about certain things. Well, then they have the true Christ, his truth, the poultice comes and removes it. It, it opens up, and this happens to everybody. I truly believe this. I don't care how long they've been in a church, but the covering's removed, and that truth enters in. At that moment is when it's up to them to receive it or reject it. And if they reject it, that's when the covering's placed over. See, just like what Christ said here, spew you out of my mouth. Because you're given the truth, you didn't accept it. Yeah. And they, 
and you can become a can-do type person, one that can see with understanding, but but uh, if they don't want it, they won't receive more. All right, verse 19, goodness gracious time. As many as I love, I rebuke. What? What does that rebuke mean? It means that he points out your faults. He loves you and he's going to let you know whether you're doing it right or doing it wrong. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That means correct. I'll correct you. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If, if I give you information about what you're doing is wrong, all right, repent and do what's right. Well, how do I know what's right or what's wrong? According to the Word of God. Very simple. Be zealous means be energetic about it. Christ is saying, don't worry. Those I love, I know how to get your attention. 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, and this means man or woman, if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now many preachers paint this as a, a rosy picture. He's at your door knocking. That's not true. Christ is not a beggar. There will be a time when you can say, when he knocks, Christ is not going to barge his way into your life. But what does it say? If any man hear my voice, and then opens the door. That means open the door to your heart. See, he'll bring, he'll bring the information to you. In other words, his calling. Invite him in. Yeah. You've got to open the door to invite him in. First you've got to hear, then you got to open the door of your heart, the door of your mind. Beloved, you have got to make the first move after he calls you and invite him in. You know, it's like I was given this thing like the peephole in the door. Some people, you know, they hear a knocking at the door and they'll just automatically go to the door and open it. But the peephole is there for a reason. It's to see who's outside. Well, guess who's also knocking on your door of your heart? Yeah. Satan. He, he wants to come in desperately in that person's life. But you got to know who you're opening the door for. But you're not going to know if you don't know his word. You know. Beloved, you have God to make the first move. What happens when you open that door? It shows faith that you're a, a believer. Then he has a reason to walk in and touch your heart. <coughs> 21. Run out of time. To him that overcometh. What does that mean, overcometh? What are you overcoming? The world. Satan. Satan. The ways of the world and the, and the ruler of it. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Now wait a minute. How are you going to sit in God's throne? The way I look at that is you can sit in his throne room. Be with him. Even as I also overcame. Now who's writing this? Or who's speaking this? Jesus is. And am sit down with my father in his throne. That doesn't mean he's sitting on the in his lap. It means he's in the throne room. Think about that. Have you ever read the forty fourth chapter of Ezekiel? Of the Zadok, the saints, the set aside ones, what their place is in the millennial temple? It's right there in, in the throne room with, with our Father, teaching for that thousand year period with Christ. What a fantastic time it's going to be. You can earn and learn all those things today, but a deadhead church won't. A deadhead individual won't. Verse 22 to complete. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And that completes the letter to the seven churches. It's over.
it's done. The churches will not be mentioned again directly until chapter 22. But, basically, the certain players of the church are mentioned throughout throughout uh, the book of Revelation. It's not, again, it's not the church name. It's the content. And just like what we covered last week in um, Revelation 3, verses 4 and 5. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which hath not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot, blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Telling us, no matter what church in, you're in, no matter what church system you're in, you can still be an overcomer. But the key thing is, is when the do when the Lord knocks on your door post of your heart and your mind, you got to open that door, and you have, you've got to accept what He has given us in His Word, and follow what He says, not what man says. And that there lies the problem with all these churches, except for two. They were following what man was saying about God instead of what God was saying about man. Any questions? Let's go before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for your teachings, for opening that door of understanding for us so that we can have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We need to know what's going on, Father. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Because people that are afraid have lack of knowledge. And you have given us all things to understand to help us overcome all the adversity of this world. And we all, and all to you, and we thank you. We pray for everyone here today that you watch over us, lead us, guide us, and direct us, and all those watching on YouTube, and that we will be quick to give you all our love and, and all our understanding of thy word. We, we thank you and honor you and, and give our praise and, and blessings to you. We love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, with all our souls, for it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.